So again, as I, as I said, my name is Kaya. I'm with Nature Calgary and I've been with Nature Calgary for three years. And um, I sit on the board and this year we've decided to do um, more uh, presentations and public events. And so this one um, we're, we're happy to present um, the International Birds on International Avenue. So before we start, uh, I'd just like to um, talk a little bit about our um, land acknowledgement journey. So Nature Calgary this year in January embarked on a, a land acknowledgement uh, process. And we've um, met several times with an elder called, uh, whose name is Sikokoto. He is with the um, Blackfoot Nation. And uh, we were able to go to the Medicine Wheel up at Nose Hill Park, um, which if you haven't been, um, is a, a really lovely spot. And it is a sacred spot to them. Um, and there he sort of talked a little bit about um, the history of, of the Blackfoot um, Nation and, and just a little bit about uh, the Blackfoot culture. And in, in that, uh, in talking with him, um, I sort of got four, four main points. And the first was to acknowledge and thank your teachers. Um, and he did that a lot as he spoke. He, he acknowledged um, where his knowledge came from and those who shared it with him. So um, we would like to thank Sikokoto for, for starting this journey with us and to share, for sharing his knowledge. Uh, the other thing he talked about was being mindful of the land. Uh, so just being respectful of what... Um, what you do, where you walk, what you take, um, and how long you spend, uh, you know, say watching a bird or um, just the things that you do. The next thing is to respect the land. So um, respect what it gives you um, and in return, um, know that you need to respect it so that it can keep providing. And then finally, uh, to share your stories and knowledge. So as time goes on, um, be sure to share what you've learned with others and to pass on that knowledge and to pass on those learnings. Um, that's a very important part of the Indigenous culture. So as, uh, as we move forward in this journey, we'll be sharing more about our process and how we're developing our land acknowledgement statements. Um, but uh, this is sort of where we are at, at the process. So who is Nature Calgary? Um, we're a community of Calgarians that promotes preservation of natural habitats, provides educational opportunities, and supports the collection of natural history observations. Um, we do all of these things. We've done them since 1955, where we started as the Calgary Field Naturalist Society, um, and we continue those today. So we still do the May species count, and um, we're involved in a number of different data collections. Uh, we have field trips on a weekly basis. Uh, we do do talks like this, speaker series, um, bird study group. And then we also uh, have acted as advocates for different natural areas in the city. This presentation uh, is coming to you because um, of TD Parks people. They provided a grant, um, not only this event, but two others that are coming up. So we would like to thank them. If you want to tweet or Instagram or Facebook, <laughs> please be sure to use the hashtag TD Ready Commitment and TD Park people, because um, we would like to acknowledge them uh, and uh, as a thank you for, for what's going on, uh, or the events we've been able to have. So we're going to be talking about two parks tonight. Um, they're side by side. The first is Elliston Park. It is a 20 hectare park in Calgary Southeast. I'm not sure if anybody is or if all of you have uh, visited it. It's the second largest body of water uh, park in the city at 20 hectares. Um, it was named after Samuel Ellis, um, who came to Calgary in 1912 from Ontario, and they, uh, his family contributed a lot to the Cal uh, history or the development of Calgary. Uh, you will also probably know Elliston Park as the site for the Global Fest Fireworks Festival. So that's usually where people, when you think of Elliston Park, um, you think of fireworks, where you'd like to change that a little bit. So when you think of Elliston Park, you think about birds. The second part of the sort of area is the 68th Street wetlands, and they're just right across the street um, from Elliston Park, and they're bordered by the landfill uh, Stony Trail, and then uh, the community of Pembroke Meadows. Uh, so it's uh, fairly well surrounded by a variety of different habitats, so um, or different sort of man-made <laughs> habitats. So it's uh, it provides sort of a refuge. Um, 
in Calgary. So uh, that's um, sort of what, uh, what we're talking about tonight. So I'm going to stop, uh, stop sharing. And I'm going to welcome uh, Megan uh, Dick, who is with the City of Calgary. She is a Parks Program Coordinator, and she's been with the City of Calgary for 12 years, oh, sorry, six years, <laughs> doubled your time, Megan. Um, so she's been with the City of Calgary for six years. And so she's going to talk a little bit about the wetlands um, and the importance of wetlands in the environment. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now for presentation. And of course, some technical issues. Just give me one minute. So while we're waiting for Megan to clear the technical issues, how many people, and you can just put this in the chat, how many people have been to Elliston Park or the 68th Street wetlands? So we have some yeses, some brand news to Calgary. Welcome to Calgary. Um, oh, somebody was there yesterday. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but there are some um, nesting um, black neck stilts and American avocets. So that's, um, as a birder, super exciting. So, oh, there we go, Meg. Try again here, sorry. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. All right. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Megan and I am a Parks Program Coordinator with Calgary Parks. Uh, before the pandemic, I was working at Ralph Klein Park and the Inglewood Bird Sanctuary. Uh, throughout my time with parks, I've had the opportunity to work in many different wetland environments, whether that was through education or stewardship initiatives like planting trees, doing beaver wiring, wiring or delivering school programs. I'm excited to share my knowledge of these spaces in Calgary with all of you. And uh, there will be time for some questions at the end. If you have any comments throughout the presentation, uh, you are welcome to type in the chat, and then at the end, I will do my best to answer. So let's start off identifying what classifies a natural area as a wetland. Simply, there are areas of land where water collects, which influences the types of plants and animals found. Therefore, uh, these low-lying areas of land are covered by water long enough to support the growth of aquatic plants. And um, the water must be present for long enough for the soil to become saturated, uh, meaning that the water is not going to drain easily. Now, how does water get to these areas? Well, there are three main ways. Uh, rain and runoff are the main sources, along with groundwater and some wetlands receive their water from rivers and streams nearby. Overall, these habitats are highly diverse and productive ecosystems that provide many ecological services and form an integral component of Alberta's diverse landscapes. So are there different types of wetlands? Yes, there's actually five classes of wetlands, which can be identified based on the source of water, presence of peat, and types of vegetation supported in the wetland environment. So this includes marshes, ponds, swamps, fens, and bogs, which are found across the prairies and forests of our province. Now the five classes of wetlands are divided into two main categories, which are peatlands and non-peatlands. 
So peatlands involve uh, that accumulation of partially decomposed organic vegetation. Uh, and approximately 20% of Alberta's surface area is covered by wetlands, with more than 90% of these uh, classified as peatlands. So types of peatlands are bogs, fens, uh, and swamps. So bogs have really poor drainage. Uh, they're very acidic, low in nutrients. Fens uh, have the flow water through them and they tend to be more basic as opposed to acidic um, and then swamps are usually dominated by trees or shrubs and they are very nutrient rich and then our non-peat lands are things like our shallow open water ponds uh, which are usually relatively small bodies of standing or flowing water and marshes which are nutrient rich and have a lot of emergent reeds rushes cattails sedges uh, on the prairies, wetlands are predominantly non-peatland, whereas in the northern regions, that's where the peatlands uh, tend to dominate. Now, the city of Calgary has a wetland conservation plan, as it's estimated that about 90% of our city's wetlands have been lost to urban development. And so goals of the plan uh, include sustainability, conservation, and ensuring there's no uh, net loss, and this is achieved through uh, regional planning, best management practices, monitoring, research, and public education. And if you're interested um, in learning more about that plan, it's available online at calgary.ca. So now I'd like to show you uh, some examples of wetlands in our city. So many of the wetlands in our city can be classified broadly into two categories. We have natural wetlands, which we just reviewed the five classes, or engineered stormwater wetlands. So Ralph Klein Park is south of Elliston Park, and it is a man-made wetland constructed specifically to improve stormwater quality before it enters the Bow River system. It's approximately 350 acres or 265 football fields in size and has the capacity to hold 6.2 billion liters of water. However, it usually operates around the 460 million liter mark. And this wetland uh, assists with treating approximately 70% of the storm water from Northeast Calgary. An example of a natural wetland in our city can be found at Griffith Woods Park. Uh, it's very rare to have a wild river like this within a major city. So in this park, the Elbow River flows through it and it's relatively straight, but it has abandoned ancient curves leaving what we call oxbow wetlands. And these wetlands combined um, or these oxbows combined with the wetlands associated with spring-fed streams that flow into the park results in very um, rich variety of aquatic species. And now for Elliston Park, which we're talking about here tonight. Uh, and we just said it's located along 17th Avenue next to the East Calgary landfill site. And um, there it does have that 20 hectare stormwater pond and uh, something else interesting about this park is it was the site of the first BP birthplace forest. So being this close to a landfill can result in more pollutants possibly contaminating this area, uh, which we'll talk about next. However, it is a great place to bird watch uh, as it usually has open water throughout the year, making it important habitat for many birds as they're able to find food in order to survive. And the treed areas also provide additional habitat, which is less common on the east side of our city as it's more of a grassland rather than parkland environment, which is what we tend to see more on the west side of the city. So why are wetlands important? Well, wetlands protect us from water pollution by cleaning the water through a variety of processes. Also, they protect us from flooding by reducing uh, water sent downstream and from drought by holding water when conditions are dry. Uh, wetlands can also help fight climate change by reducing greenhouse gases as they are a carbon sink. Uh, further, wetlands 
uh, provide hundreds of species with uh, habitat and of course give us natural areas to explore. They are often destinations for hiking, canoeing, uh, photography, and because of their importance to uh, man and humans over time, many wetlands are key historical or archeological sites. And the city recognizes the direct connection between biodiversity and community well-being as uh, intact natural processes like healthy wetlands support our health. Uh, we need biodiversity to be personally and socially healthy. And it is a core component of strong, cohesive and inclusive communities. Therefore, we must um, protect these important natural areas. So wetland wildlife. Wetlands are home to a variety of birds, mammals, invertebrates, reptiles, fish, plants, and amphibians. Uh, the photos of, uh, here highlight uh, some of the species we can find in wetlands around the city, including uh, great blue herons, muskrats, mallard ducks, and caddisfly larvae, which are a type of aquatic invertebrate. And what's really interesting is some species uh, act as bioindicators, and this means that by looking at which species are living in a wetland and how many of that species is present, we can uh, figure out whether or not a wetland might be polluted. So some aquatic invertebrates like water mites and side swimmers um, are tolerant to pollution, so they can live in clean water or dirty water really without a problem. Whereas other species like the caddisfly larva are more sensitive to pollution, meaning that they're only going to be living in cleaner water and we're not going to find them in those polluted areas. And different species are present depending on uh, the, the type of wetland. So for example, uh, riparian areas are those um, where the plants and soil are strongly influenced by the presence of water, and there are those transitional lands between aquatic ecosystems, whether that's wetlands, rivers, streams, lakes. Um, so the Bow and Elbow Rivers are great examples of riparian habitat and are home to many species of wildlife, including things like beavers, moose, um, wrens, osprey. And it's important to note that wetlands are very key habitat for my birds. And um, I really think the best time to visit these natural areas, including places like Elliston Park, are in the spring and fall, as there's opportunity to see um, species that are migrating through. So some uh, birds are only using our wetlands as a stopover point before they continue their journey further north or south meaning uh, that they're not using these wetland habitats in our city to necessarily complete their life cycle, but rather just support it. So I want to dive a bit deeper into wetland functions, uh, but first we need to discuss stormwater as Elliston Park uh, has a stormwater pond. So stormwater is rainwater or melted snow that ends up in nearby water bodies. And when stormwater runs off the landscape, it is often contaminated with garbage, sediments, different hydrocarbons, salt, bacteria, uh, even fertilizers. And so stormwater, I have wastewater up here because sometimes they're confused, but wastewater is just the water inside of our home. So when you flush your toilet, fill your sink, take a shower, run the washing machine, all that water is draining into um, our sanitary sewer system. And um, both our wastewater and stormwater do end up in the Bow River. The difference is that 100% of wastewater makes a stop at a water treatment plant before it's returned to the river, whereas only about 30% of the stormwater uh, collected in Calgary gets some kind of treatment before it flows back to the Bow River. And it isn't legally re required to be treated unlike wastewater. However, um, it can collect a surprising amount of pollution and contamination as it flows into our river. And so that's why uh, wetlands like Elliston Park are so important. 
So how do these stormwater wetlands clean the water exactly? Well, um, these are some of the pro processes. So there's sedimentation where um, large pollutants have the opportunity to settle down into the bottom. Uh, there's phytoremediation. So for example, cattails, they can absorb pollutants into their roots. Uh, UV radiation, so sunlight can help to break down hydrocarbons and remove harmful bacteria. Um, good bacteria in the water can um, convert the bad bacteria into a usable form. And then uh, aeration, so increased dissolved oxygen is uh, reducing volumes. So protecting these wetland habitats, we need to consider um, how we can prevent common pollutants like the garbage, sediment, salts from entering our stormwater. And uh, we can do this through engaging in simple, what I like to call eco actions. So this could be, uh, you know, naturalizing part of your yard to avoid the use of fertilizers as native plants don't require as much maintenance. Uh, just ensuring we're being responsible vehicle owners and that our cars are not in need of repairs and leaking anything onto our roads, which is finding its way into our rivers. Um, being a responsible pet owner, so cleaning up after your dog as their um, waste can have harmful bacteria in it like E. coli. And um, if you're doing any kind of construction, making sure that you're placing a barrier around stormwater drains in the area to prevent sediments from entering in. Um, but overall, I think the most important thing you can do, and it was mentioned uh, in the introduction here, is to you know, start conversation with others about wetlands and share your knowledge. And then uh, I'll close the presentation with some uh, important messages about wood frogs, another wetland species. Uh, and this is from Calgary Captured, which is a wildlife uh, monitoring program in our city. And it's a great way that you can get involved with citizen science and, you know, demonstrate those eco actions along with, other, with using other apps, like if you have iNaturalist. Um, and I really hope that you're interested to continue learning more about wetlands and uh, are committed to supporting wetland health in the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Megan. Um, so uh, I'll just uh, throw it over to Matt um, with any questions um, for you. Hey Megan, we just have one question in the chat for you here. It says, "Sure, does the city have an inventory or know where the remaining 10% of natural wetlands are located in Calgary? Yes, I believe they do. Um, they did an extensive inventory when that conservation plan was developed. Um, so they kind of had a baseline as to where we were starting. Okay, and another one just came in here asking... What is the life cycle of storm ponds? Um, I'm not exactly sure. I want to say that it's different. Um, I know out at Ralph Klein Park, it does have a certain life cycle, but as things have gone on, that has changed. So I think it depends how stressed the area is and um, what kind of cleaning practices can be done throughout its life, I suppose, but I don't have exact numbers, sorry. Okay, and another question here, is all the flood mitigation completed now? Um, I am not totally sure on that. I know that just last year they uh, were working on completing that bioengineering site in Inglewood along the river. So that was a big project that um, recently wrapped up. So if you have the chance to go there and visit it, it's really interesting. And they're um, going to be adding some interpretive signage as well. Okay, there's a couple more popping up here. So 
one I can answer here. It says, what is the access to the 68th Street wetlands? Well, you can access it right off of 68th Street. Um, and also the Rotary Greenway encompasses it. So next question is, how do they decide when to remove cattails? Um, I haven't really heard of them removing any cattails. Normally, um, when a stormwater pond or a wetland is establishing, that's when we see those starting to grow. Um, and because they do provide habitat and different functions with cleaning the water, um, I haven't observed a case where they remove them. Okay, and another question here is, with older communities and new developments, what is the city's plan regarding wetlands? Um, so we do want to make sure that we have um, obviously wetlands in our city and there's quite a few in newer communities where um, they're going to be naturalized. So I talked a little bit about naturalization um, just because that can assist with the wetland completing those beneficial functions and providing habitat and really reducing overall costs with maintaining the area, which is good. Um, so if you want to find out more about that, um, I believe you go to calgary.ca um, slash habitat restoration, I think, and there's more information about it there. <clears throat> Okay, thanks very much. I think Kaya, if you would like to take it from here. Yep. All right. Uh, so the next presenter we have is Dan Arndt. He is a wildlife biologist. Um, he's been uh, heavily involved in the Calgary birding community for numerous years. He's done work with Calgary Birds, uh, Friends of Fish Creek. Um, and we're really happy to have him as a presenter. Um, he is a uh, very knowledgeable on the birds uh, in, in not just uh, this area, but all of Alberta. So um, I will throw it over to Dan and uh, I'll let him take it away from here. Hey everyone, um, as mentioned, I'm Dan Arndt and uh, I'm just gonna share my presentation here. Hopefully it is working. Dan, there's been a request to see your, your face. Okay, one second. <laughs> So there was a question about uh, blue herons um, and pelicans. As far as I know, pelicans um, aren't at Elliston Park and uh, 68th Street. Uh, Dan might know better, but definitely you will find uh, herons there for sure. All right, do we have the presentation working? Yes, I can see it. Okay, perfect. All right, um, yeah, so I'm just gonna get started here. Um, might need to stop it to start my video here, hang on. You should just be able to go to the bottom and just click stop, uh, start video. Okay, there we go. Okay. So we'll get this started. Um, I originally was asked to do this presentation uh, a couple weeks ago and uh, decided to jump at the chance because it's it's one of, I would say, 
a bit of a hidden gem in the city. It's it's a great spot you can go all year long. And the main reason is because it's got a wide variety of habitats. Um, in the wetlands, on, in the 68th Street wetlands, there's cattails, there's open water, there's a mixture of grasslands and the riparian areas. So the Forest Lawn Creek, which is essentially what runs between Stony Trail um, and the landfill. And then there's all of the connector channels between the wetland basins and each of those different types of habitats can be home for a whole bunch of different kinds of birds. Um, and then when you add in the open water of Elliston Lake that sometimes stays open at least partially all winter long, you have a huge variety. Um, I didn't really want to focus too much on, on the birds that are in the treed areas in Elliston Park because that's, uh, you can find a lot of those birds in most other open parks, uh, sorry, treed parks in the city of Calgary, but it's a bit unique. There's only a handful of these big wetland focused habitats within the city of Calgary. So we'll do some background stats here for Elliston Park. Um, most people have been visiting the park since about 1991. Um, majority of the sightings on eBird anyway have been since 1995. Some of that is historical entries that people have thrown in to the database. Um, others are just what, you know, what, what people have seen. And uh, as they were going through, eBird has only really been around since about 2003, 2004 in like the infant, infantile stages, but hasn't really been used heavily since about 2010. So all these historical observations are a li little bit with a grain of salt, but for the most part, this is what we've got. Uh, over, the, over the 25 years or so, there's been 174 species at Elliston Park. And one new species is observed in 2021, which isn't surprising. Um, more people are going, especially since 2020, more people have been interested in birds and getting out and seeing stuff. So um, more people that go to a place, the more likely they are to find new things. Um, 1,182 complete checklists submitted. So that would be essentially if you spent every day and went to Elliston Park for three years, that's roughly the number of checklists you, you'd have. So I'm Hopefully someone who lives in the area is actually curious to actually try that and just go there every day and see what they see, because I'm sure you will definitely add new birds to the list for both Ellison Park and 68th Street. So the wetlands on 68th Street though, um, there are records going back to 1996. Um, the majority of those, of those sightings though have been since 2014, since the wetlands were more established and more built up. Um, over the last 25 years, there are 145 species observed there, and I'm sure the numbers at 68th Street are actually going to go up much faster than the numbers went up at Elliston Park, just because of the, that wide variety of habitats I was talking about. Um, just in 2021, there have been 10 new species observed, which is actually pretty impressive um, because it's, it's just a huge amount. It's almost 10% of all the species that have been seen there ever have been added just in the last six months, uh, one of which was actually seen by one of our hosts. Um, so that's an interesting little side note. And there's about 765 ch checklists completed. Um, so there's a difference on eBird when you're looking at submitting your data, you can do an incomplete checklist, which just says, I saw this, I didn't really count all the other stuff that was there, but I know I saw a bald eagle and it was important to put it in the database. That's an incomplete, so those aren't included in these because they, they don't really go towards the actual scientific research that eBird can, uh, can help out with. Um, so the 10 new species, one of them, the mo one of the, more, the most interesting ones one that was seen by, by, by Kaya was the marsh rat. And uh, that I'll get to because I actually highlighted it in my, in my talk a little bit later. Um, so the birds that you see there in the winter, both parks are good. Again, Elliston Park has open water, which can concentrate a whole lot of waterfowl in there. Usually it's just mallards, um, but every once in a while you get some highlights that are hanging out there that, uh, that people will go visit every single day. Um, but as, the, as it gets colder and as we get those really big deep freezes, you have fewer and fewer waterfowl and then the species diversity there decreases. But in both Elliston Park and 68th Street Wetlands, you have birds like the American Tree Sparrow that will often overwinter in very small numbers, but they're using those cattails as a source of shelter. 
And they're also feeding on the seeds, as you can see this guy here, feeding on the seeds from the cattails and the grasses that grow in that more naturalized habitat of the wetlands. And you get common ravens. Um, one of the main reasons that they are there is because they're spending a lot of time down at the landfill. And as they push the, the waste around, they go in and feed on any loose food that's still in there and uh, you know potential for other animals like mice and voles that are meeting their uh, an untimely end by the uh, the dozers. But then they're also going to be hunting things like those sick ducks that may uh, may succumb to the weather and they're scavengers, so they'll do what scavengers need to do. Um, there are huge numbers of ravens there in the winter and, and into the early spring um, in the hundreds. It's uh, the species has had a huge population boom in the last 30 years or so. Canada geese. Um, and there's an, a mallard in the photo as well, just right, uh, right of center. Um, these guys, they spend all winter there again. As, as the water freezes up, they will concentrate into bigger and bigger numbers into a smaller and smaller amount of space. Sometimes if it's not super cold, they'll actually just huddle together in the water and keep, an, keep that open patch open through the entire winter. Other times when it gets down to below minus 20 or so, even the body heat of the geese isn't enough to keep the water open. So eventually they will just move on um, until, until it reopens. One of the main reasons that uh, the water at Elliston Park stays open or in Elliston Lake stays open in the winter is actually that influx of storm water that is slightly warmer temperature into the colder water of the lake keeps that inflow area pretty open for sometimes up to a couple hundred meters. Um, if it doesn't get super cold in the winter though, it can stay open all winter long. Geese are nice. You can see them all over the city in the winter. Um, Calgary's got a unique sort of um, badge of honor in North America where I think we have some of the highest populations of Canada geese that overwinter here because the Bow River stays open throughout the winter as well, thanks to the uh, water treatment plants that are dumping that slightly above freezing water into the river all winter long. So it keeps huge patches of the river open. So the Canada geese stick here, it's actually been a help in keeping the population numbers up. Um, I'm sure some folks might remember years ago, um, Canada geese were very hard to find and their numbers were, were declining and there was actually a risk of them becoming extirpated in parts of North America, but the habitat conservation and the conservation of the species with hunting and Ducks Unlimited and various other um, environmental organizations have helped their numbers really, really spike back up. Great horned owls. Um, these guys are going to be hunting anything that's in the wetlands that they can find, uh, but they're also overwintering usually in the spruce trees in Elliston Park. Um, there's a couple spots where I suspect that they've nested in the last number of years, and uh, they're around. They're they're actually den the density of these species in the city is actually much higher than people think. Um, anywhere where there's about a square kilometer of of um, appropriate habitat or an older established neighborhood that has large spruce trees, you're going to find great horned owls, and they're going to be eating everything from squirrels, ducks, geese, to mice, voles, outdoor cats sometimes, they'll eat anything because they are very good generalist predators and they're very good at what they do. And one of the th things that you can look for in, uh, in Elliston Park in the winter. Black-billed magpies and gray partridge. Um, both of these are also found in the winter in both Elliston Park and the 68th Street wetlands. Not the most interesting of birds, but partridge are something that uh, they're an introduced species to North America. They were originally introduced for hunting purposes, but now they're a pretty naturalized species in southern Alberta, and their numbers here are actually much higher in density here in southern Alberta than they are in their native habitat in Europe, which is pretty impressive. There's There have been some studies in the 1980s, and then um, another study in 
the early 2010s, I believe it was, that compared the data and their numbers here are just, they've taken off and they're doing quite well. The more exciting birds though, they will start to come out in the spring. And that's where really all the, the splashes of color, the exciting birds that will get people coming out day after day looking for them. As that water opens up in the wetlands and as the lake opens up, it provides more open habitat. It will actually start to bring some of the grasses and, and plants back to life. It um, gives the birds a little bit more hiding space, but then it also gives them a little bit more foraging space where they can go after the insects and the fish that are in the wetland and in the lake um, and allow competition to not be quite so stiff. Both of the, of the parks, though, are great for northern pintail. Um, these are formerly um, were a sensitive species in Alberta and their numbers, they were considered to be one of the most highest impacted birds to wetland destruction and wetland um, removal in North America. And now their numbers are really starting to kick back as well. Um, and it's parks like Elliston and the 68th Street wetlands that, that really help out with these guys on their migration routes and in, in breeding. I don't know if they've been recorded breeding at the wetlands yet, uh, but it would not surprise me. They uh, usually stick around in small numbers, ones or twos, um, in terms of, sorry, I guess I should say twos or fours in, in, uh, in pairs when they're breeding in the, in the spring and summer. And uh, yeah, I'm sure if you spent long enough, you'd probably find a couple of them hanging around. They're very interesting bird to see when they're in flight. They're incredibly distinctive with that long pointy tail that they get their name from and their coloring and their calls are, are a sight to be, to be seen and heard for sure. Gulls, they're spending time on the lakes and on Elston Lake and the 68th Street wetlands for the exact same reason as the ravens are in the winter. And the ravens are there all, all year long, but these guys, when they show up in the spring, they can bring other gulls with them and other weird stuff with them. So California gulls, ring-billed gulls, Franklin's gulls, and herring gulls are the four most common ones that we get in the city of Calgary. All of those you'll find at both parks. California gulls though are probably the most abundant, uh, especially as you get from spring into, into summer. And what, you will often find people doing from about mid-March to late April is going out to either of the parks with a scope or binoculars and just spending an hour looking at every single gull trying to find the weird one that looks different that is an unusual species to the area and a couple of those have been seen this year in fact as well. Things like Sabine's gull was seen at Elliston Park in April I believe. Greater yellow legs, they aren't the flashiest bird, but they're another very good indicator that there's good mudflat habitat or there's good shorebird habitat in general because they will spend their entire day just sticking that bill into the mud, picking out insects and foraging and, and often in, in very large numbers. They're a good uh, harbinger of spring once they start to show up in April. Um, they have another species that's very similar is the lesser yellow legs and their bill is much shorter relative to their head. Between the two, they, they, when they're standing side by side, you can really tell them apart, but just one photo of one species by itself, it can be a bit of a challenge. So, um, but the big thing about them is that where these guys go, a lot of other shorebirds will show up as well because it shows that there's good habitat for them to forage. Like these guys, American avocets, They've got that gorgeous uh, red or orange head, the black and white patterning on the back. We got really bright blue legs, almost as bright blue as the water in, the, in this photo. Um, and that upcurved bill helps them just sweep the top of the water for invertebrates that they, that they seem to really prefer to eat. Rather than sticking the bill into the mud, they'll just kind of sweep their head back and forth across the surface and pick up flies and, and insects and sometimes fish, sometimes other small morsels. I've, I've seen them pick at uh, berries and things like that that have fallen into, into the water on, on migration in the fall. Um, really, really good generalist birds. But again, they're an indicator that the habitat is appropriate. Um, they tend to like a little bit more salty or, or alkali wetlands, but um, 
on migration in the spring, these guys show up and they're a hit. And then Robins, everyone knows these guys as the, the classic harbinger of spring. Um, this photo, in fact, was taken in Elliston Park a few years ago. Um, this bird is a male. It probably had just arrived the night before because uh, their numbers hadn't really been seen in the city whatsoever. But uh, if you're looking for your first birds, of, your first robins of the spring, I think Elliston Park is probably one of your best spots for them because they, where the park is situated on the edge of the city, it's a prime stopover spot for these birds that are flying over the prairies that have almost no trees whatsoever into this park that has a whole bunch of poplar and spruce trees where they can get some shelter. And then the water there too allows them to just refuel right away as soon as they, as soon as they can. And so the birds you're going to go see if you were to go out tomorrow are probably these ones here. The uh, summer is probably one of the most interesting uh, interesting seasons to be birding in uh, in these parks in terms of the diversity and, and the unique birds that you can see there that you probably aren't going to see anywhere else inside the city limits. So northern shovelers, they're a classic wetland bird. If you go out to any prairie wetland, east of the city or even west of the city, um, you're going to find these birds. They're abundant. They have that big, big hefty bill. They kind of look a little bit like a mallard, but they're using that bill, sucking up a bunch of water and then si uh, using the bill like a sieve to seek to get all of the invertebrates out of the water and let the water back into the lake. And so they're almost almost like a whale would. They uh, are really fun to watch. They are abundant. But again, Elliston Park and uh, the 68th Street wetlands are probably the best place in the city limits. And I know for a fact that these guys have bred at, uh, at the 68th Street wetlands. I've seen them with their chicks uh, last year in one of, the, one of the big, I think the main wetland in the south east, sorry, southwest corner. Black crown night heron can be a hard bird to find in the city, almost impossible but they seem to have set up along that uh, Forest Lawn Creek area between Stony Trail and the landfill. Um, they come back to those, those areas to breed year after year. So you can find them in really good numbers, um, usually in, in Elliston Park, probably half a dozen or so every year. I don't know if they've shown back up yet this year, but um, if you were looking for a place for them in the city, this is this is your spot. They um, they're colonial nesters, so yeah, there's usually about six to ten, sometimes up to twenty, but they have lots of babies. So come August, when uh, if you if you were to scare up uh, a colony, you might have twenty, thirty birds all flush up all at the same time, and they're much smaller than the blue, than the great blue herons. These guys are probably about half the size, and their neck isn't quite as long. So they don't really stretch it out. They just kind of look kind of like this guy does. Little squat, big, hefty bill, and uh, that bright red eye really stands out too. A killdeer, they also are all over the place in the city. Um, but again, that, that unique habitat that we have in, 60, in the 68th Street Wetlands and, and Elliston Park is good for them because it's relatively undisturbed. Uh, Ellison Park less so because there usually are dog walkers and stuff that will scare these birds off of nests. But um, again, responsible pet ownership and responsible dog walkers usually tend to avoid areas when they see these guys flush up. Um, but the wetlands are really good for these guys as well. And they, uh, they're they pretty abundant. Not particularly unique to the park, but uh, probably one of my favorite birds for sure. And Forster's terns. Uh, there's two species that kind of look like this. There's Forster's terns and common terns. Both can occur in the city. Forster's is definitely the one that you're going to see if you are at Elliston Park. Um, probably, I don't know, maybe five or six pair, um, usually flying around the lake, eating up, scooping up fish, and uh, doing the same thing across the road over at the 68th Street wetlands. They're uh, really fun to watch in flight and really elegant, gorgeous looking birds. They are another really good indicator of, of wetland health in the sense that they require 
abundant invertebrate populations. And so when those invertebrates are breeding and there are a whole bunch of them and there's a lot of diversity there, then you start getting your turns coming in and feeding on them. And if there's enough for them to establish a nest, it shows that that population of invertebrates and fish is actually quite healthy as well. And this little guy here, the marshland. This, um, this guy was one of the new species added this year to the 68th Street wetlands, uh, but it's no surprise. I think it's just a matter of time, someone getting, going out and finding them there. They need cattails, they need bulrushes to breed in. Um, and now that those, the, the cattails and bulrushes are an established and healthy density within the park, they were almost certain to, to show up again. It shows that it's a nice, healthy wetland, that there's lots of food for animals to eat, specifically birds. And then if they're willing to stick around and have babies, it just shows that that habitat is probably at a, at a level where it's more naturalized than something like um, many of the community lakes that are really just a big open water lake that doesn't have a lot of surrounding vegetation around the edges. And common yellowthroats, these are another guy that uh, they need those cattails, they need those bulrushes, and that uh, wetland vegetation around the edges. So these, uh, these are a warbler species that uh, doesn't really act like a warbler. Again, it acts more like a wren or like a, uh, like a shorebird almost in some cases. They're very secretive and, and reclusive, but their, their song just carries quite a ways so you can hear them long before you see them most often you'll hear them and maybe never see them when you when you observe them in the field and we'll wrap it up with the fall birds there's a couple species that that seem to use both elliston lake and the 68th street wetlands more in the fall than they do in the spring and it's kind of curious as to why i'm not even sure specifically what would cause them to show up more often in the fall than in the spring. Um, maybe it's because the water stays open just a little bit longer, maybe because there's better fish stocks in the fall and there's there's more food for them compared to the spring, but it, it's really hard to say. Um, but things like common red poles, so they'll show up, they'll show up around October, November, and they'll be feeding on those seed heads from the cattails. Um, so that's that's an good expl explanation for why these guys are showing up because they are going after the, those cattail seeds. Um, they're an abundant source of food, lots of things eat those, those but common red poles really seem to prefer, pref prefer them. And they don't show up every year. They just show up when the cone crops for spruce, pine, alder, um, seed bearing, sorry, cone bearing trees in the north have no seeds that year. So when they come down, it tells you that, that the, those cone-bearing plants in the north just haven't had anything that year. So they are forced to come down to look for food. Swans, both trumpeter swans and, and uh, tundra swans will show up in the fall. Um, you get them flying over sometimes in the spring, but not really using the lake or the wetlands as a major migratory stopover in the spring. You don't get them in big numbers, but in the fall, you can get some pretty good concentrations there. Um, Again, it might just be the submergent vegetation in the, in the wetlands and the lake, or it might just be the fact that it's a big open water body that, uh, and everything's starting else, everything else is starting to freeze up. These guys, the Hooter Mergansers, they're probably the highlight uh, uh, attraction in the fall at Elliston Lake specifically, but then also at, uh, at the wetlands. You can get rafts of 40 or 50 of these guys in a single day. Um, on either of those uh, those water bodies, it's uh, it's very impressive to see, and they're such a stunning bird. And rusty blackbirds, they have not been seen often at either of the wetlands, but they are there and they have been seen. So I think it's just a matter of people going out looking for them uh, the right time of year. More people getting out and seeing the. Uh, what's available in the wetlands and uh, spending more time there because again there's such a a great spot and a little hidden gem on the edge of the city that if you were thinking about somewhere to go and wanted to go out to one of the lakes outside the city maybe just maybe just spend the time in the city instead and, and look for stuff in places where 
it might show up, but it's not confirmed. It's not a hundred percent that you're going to, you're going to see what you're looking for, but the more people to go out, the more likely you are going to find new things that uh, people haven't seen there before. So that actually is going to wrap up my presentation. So if anyone has any questions, then uh, I think we'll leave those to Matt to filter those out. Thanks so much. Hey, thanks very much, Dan. Very interesting to always see these unique birds popping up in those parks. Uh, we have a question regarding, does Global Fest affect these birds at all? Uh, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, in my experience, it does seem to disturb them. Um, I've seen birds, I, I haven't been to Global Fest in a few years, especially since, um, the 68th Street wetlands really got established as an, uh, a major breeding bird habitat. But I do remember when they would set off some of the test uh, fireworks earlier in the evening, you'd sometimes see big flocks of geese or ducks or cormorants getting flushed off the lake or from where what is what used to be behind Elliston Park and is now the wetlands flushed up and see them flying over. So they do get disturbed. I don't think they're going to be it's very unlikely that they would be injured or harmed by it, aside from just losing a couple hours worth of rest that they probably are pretty desperate for. Um, songbirds on migration, though, using the trees as overnight shelter might be more of a concern, but I don't know that anyone's really studied it or looked into what the actual impacts are uh, 100%. Okay, we have someone curious as to what the 10 new species were this year. Um, I will take a look at that actually. One second. I know we had marsh wren and we had Sabine's gall added at the 68th Street wetlands. Um, the new species at Elliston Park was pectoral sandpiper. And the other ones at 68th Street wetlands. Let's see. So we've got Marsh Run, Sabine's Gull, Hudsonian Godwit, uh, Ruby Crown Kinglet, Red Breasted Nuthatch which makes sense because the wetlands themselves don't have as much habitat, but it was probably a bird that was heard at Elliston Park. It's just a matter of how people split up their lists. When you're putting in a list for the wetlands, you're probably going to hear stuff over at Elliston Park and vice versa. So um, that would explain that, as well as downy woodpecker, black cap chickadee. Uh, Eurasian widgeon is another one that was seen at the wetlands that is new, but again, I would say not particularly surprising. I've seen them there, I actually saw them there myself this year as well. So, um, and then the other two are some hybrids of uh, redhead and lesser scop and just redhead and scop species. So probably the same bird, just classified in two different ways. Okay, so we have a question about the trails at the wetlands. So it is a bit of a rogue birding location. Generally, people are walking in off of a gravel road. Do you think at any point, Dan, there may be some more established trails there besides the current bike path? Well, I'm going to share my screen again here really quick because there is a bit of an established trail that already exists. Um, it's not the most extensive, but uh, yeah, let me just share my screen here. So let me know when that pops up for you guys. So the parking area is still over here. I can't see it, I think. How's that? That's better, thanks. Okay, so we've got the parking area over here and you can see here where there's a gate here and it's mostly graveled in. So this is the area most people are going to follow um, to do their birding. And then they'll connect over here and you can see 
a little bit of people have gone rogue and kind of made their own trails down here and across this area here. Um, this is actually the bike trail that connects up here. So really, if you wanted to make a loop of it, the best way to do it would be to start over here at Elliston Park, work your way around all these wetlands over to the bike path and come back around. It's going to get you to all that good habitat. And if you took this pathway over here to where the night herons usually get seen, you're pretty much going to hit all those key spots for birds within uh, within the 68th Street wetlands area. Um, I would say the area that probably gets birded the least is this area here, because most people are just going to go from the car, go down the trail here, check out this wetland, and maybe get up to here and check out these two. But probably these guys here and then these ones right by the off ramp are probably, you know, there's probably stuff there that's, that's hiding that people don't really go see. Well, I can say that um, that little tiny wetland um, at the corner of 17th and uh, 60, well, Stony uh, has some nesting um, avocets and black neck stilts. So um, they're behind the fence line, but uh, it's kind of interesting to see those uh, nesting birds there. That's great. And Dan, we have one more question here. Perhaps Megan can uh, tune in on this one too. Are dogs restricted during the breeding season? Well, I'll speak to that initially. Um, I believe both parks, sorry, 683 Wetlands, I believe is entirely on leash. Um, the portion of Elliston Lake where there is an off-leash area is fairly small. I think it's just near that uh, that eastern parking lot. And then the rest of it should be an on-leash area. Um, I think enforcement is is really the question more so whether they are restricted or whether the enforcement is there to restrict what the rules are as they stand. All right, um, for the question, so take it away, Kaya. All right, um, so I'm just going to share my screen one last time. Um, and so, got to, so I just want to, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, uh, so I just want to say um, we have some upcoming events uh, for Nature Calgary. So if um, you're interested in uh, birding, we have a lot of activities around that. We've started a birding 101 class. Um, so there are four online sessions as well as four field trips. The ones in um, the first ones start tomorrow. And I think I have one more spot for the Saturday mornings. Um, we provide binoculars and it's free for members. Um, we also have uh, July um, classes open up. So if you're interested in that, um, you can join. Uh, on June 12th, um, I'm doing a presentation with the Calgary Public Library. It's free and it's called Bird Watching Hobby with No Barriers. So it basically talks about how you get into bird watching and some of the, the birds that you might see um, throughout the whole city. Um, we both mostly focus on wetlands and forests um, and just some of the things that you'll see. We also do field trips on a weekly basis now that uh, restrictions are <laughs> um, easing. Uh, and I think um, we have a pretty strong roster. I think everybody wants to get out um, for um, birding so and um, John McFall I think who's on the call uh, will do a lot of the botany stuff so hopefully we'll um, have people with, for that um, and then we have two more events in this series um, the sort of your park series one is the beyond the birds on international avenue so we'll be doing some um, botany walks um, as well as some birding walks and we'll have binoculars for those who don't have them. Um, we'll also do some pond dipping so you can see some of the invertebrates that um, are in those um, ponds so you can see what the birds are actually eating. And then we also have um, a natural history interpretive centers or station. Um, so we'll probably bring out some of our uh, 
we've got a stuffed great horn owl and a few other fun things. And then on September 7, and that's on July 31st from 10 to 2. Um, and then uh, September 17th, we're going to be doing part of the park cleanup. Um, and we'll be doing Elliston Park and 68th Street wetlands. Um, we'll also be building bird houses and um, bumblebee houses. So that's a good one to keep on your calendar. Um, and I think that's it uh, for tonight. Thank you so much for coming. I know it was a beautiful night that you missed outside, but hopefully this gives you an introduce, introduction to Elliston Park and those 68th Street wetlands. And as Dan said, the more people that get out there, the more birds we'll find there. So we uh, thank everybody for coming and we wish you all great birding this summer.